All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Bertler, and I will be your host uh, for this workshop. Uh, I am a NOFA Massachusetts uh, volunteer uh, board member, and you are attending the Planting for Pollinators workshop with Anna Filkoff. Um, before we get started, I just have a few announcements um, and logistics to cover before we get started. We have a number of sponsors who help make our conference possible, and I encourage you to purchase from them whenever you can. And if you are able to, to purchase from them, please let them know that you uh, appreciate their support of NOFA. We also, most importantly, want to thank you, our viewers and listeners, especially those of you who are members of NOFA, of any of the chapters. Uh, we definitely rely on all of our members to make our education and advocacy work possible and to keep the NOFAs, all the chapters, healthy and strong and vibrant. So if you're not a NOFA member, please, please uh, check that out. Also, I'll just mention, uh, as part of the summer conference, if you've been in person to the summer conference in years past, you're familiar with the all the great vendors that we typically have in person. Um, I'm happy to say that all of our vendors actually, we do have an online marketplace on the program book and website. So if you're interested in making purchases directly through them, uh, by all means, feel free to do that. We are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land you now occupy. For those of you joining from outside New England, this interactive map can be found at native-land.ca. Some of you may also be attending for QR, um, or continuing education credits for this workshop. And if you're doing that, here, here is the QR code for you to scan in order to get those credits. And now my distinguished guests, I am pleased to introduce to you Anna. Anna is currently with the Wild Seed Project in Portland, Maine. And this is her second time presenting at the conference. So we're thrilled to have Anna. And Anna, why don't you take it away? OK. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Fialkoff. Um, and I work now for Wild Seed Project. I am a new program manager. And I just started about a month ago. Um, so most recently, I was actually senior horticulturist at uh, Native Plant Trust's Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts. And um, I have a real passion for native plants and all that they have to offer um, and an interest in both ecological design and uh, sustainable landscape design um, and horticulture. So um, you can kind of uh, come with me on this journey um, thinking about plants for pollinators and see um, what it might mean to create habitat for pollinators through that lens. So um, food security is probably the first thing that comes to mind when a lot of us think about pollinators, especially us as gardeners and farmers and people who are just enthusiastic and interested in food. Um, one of every three of our bites we eat exists because of animal pollinators. Um, and those animal pollinators are bees, particularly butterflies, moths, birds, bats, beetles, flies, and other insects. And so far, honeybees are the ones that get the most attention. Honeybees are actually not native to uh, North America. They're European, and they are brought in um, specifically to pollinate a lot of our food crops and produce honey. And though they do so many great services for us, um, I wanna highlight some of our native pollinators that also do a lot for us um, that can help kind of fill the void um, and the gap between all the time periods when honeybees are actually pollinating some of our food crops. There are also a lot of food crops that are pollinated by a range of other pollinators. And um, they're, just as much in peril um, as honeybees, um, they're rapidly losing habitat. And um, I wanna kind of talk to you today about how to support them. So basically we need um, 
pollinators for our food, which is very true. And we also need plants in order to support our pollinators. And so a lot of those are insects. Plants are the basis of the food web. And they are you know, where we start. Um, recent research by the University of Delaware professor Douglas Tallamy points to a crucial threshold of a minimum of 70% native plant biomass for a landscape to support the insects that in turn support birds which, are the, which serve as the bellwether of ecological health and resiliency. So birds actually, songbirds in spring, um, rely very heavily and throughout the, the year heavily on insects. And in spring, they especially rely heavily on caterpillars of moths and butterflies to feed their young. They're kind of these perfectly packaged proteins, kind of like a little sausage or something that they can quickly deposit to their young in the, into their mouths. Um, and this, these pollinators, the moths and butterflies, are especially important to support because of their, um, their food for birds and other wildlife. If we can provide connected habitat, that means you know, habitat that, uh, where there's corridors between large patches and smaller patches of places with enough native plant biomass to support them, then we can keep these pollinators and the wide diversity of pollinators that we have um, intact. Um, we do have some pollinators that are not necessarily you know, in trouble. There are some species of bumblebees that are not, that are you know, present in a lot of other species of bees, but um, there's actually a wide diversity of bumblebees and other species of bees that are native to New England. Um, that are, you know, we're losing a lot of that diversity and a lot of those um, species are threatened. So while habitat provides alternate foraging options for when a specialty crop um, might not be in flower, they also provide a place to live. Um, so the plants actually provide a place for pollinators to live and complete their life cycles throughout the entire year. Um, when they're not necessarily just pollinating flowers. And in our urban, suburban, and rural areas, we can do a lot to create more connected habitat. So I forgot to mention that, you know, we have this really beautiful view of Riverberry, Riverberry Farm in Fairfax, Vermont. They're doing a lot to create um, more habitat for pollinators by way of hedgerows that have maybe both productive crops and uh, pollinator plants. So those might be things like aronia berry and elderberry, um, which we can get fruits from, but also provide um, places for a lot of these insects to complete their life cycles. Um, and if we can con continue to do this in some of these rural areas around farmland, that's great because they're connected to these, you can see this forest system, they're connected to these larger patches of habitat around riparian zones and large intact places. But overall through development, our habitat is getting fragment fragmented. And so what we can do in rural and urban and suburban places is create more habitat. The default landscape in a lot of these places is lawn, unfortunately. And lawns really suck. <laughs> they suck money and time and resources. Um, they use huge amounts of water that's unnecessary. Uh, fossil fuels through mowing and pesticides and herbicides are sprayed on lawns um, to make sure that there aren't any pests on them and to keep keep kind of the monoculture of grass. And then fertilizer, fertilizers are used to um, keep them green. But all of these things are inputs that are not necessary for native plants. And um, there are things that actually do harm to the environment. So while fertilizers um, might wash into uh, stormwater runoff and go into water bodies, creating things like toxic algal blooms, um, pesticides and herbicides actually can be very harmful to pollinators because they ingest plants and then therefore ingest the pesticides. Um, lawns are also practically sterile. If you think about the type of landscape it is, it's just kind of a, a two-dimensional plane 
that gets mowed down so it doesn't flower and nothing has a chance to eat it. Um, so we can do a lot better. Um, we can start by, you know, reducing the lawn that we have in our, um, in our own homes and in our suburban and urban neighborhoods. And we can, you know, you can start by doing something as simple as letting the lawn flower every now and then. So if you're not mowing it as frequently or you're mowing it a little bit higher, um, you can allow things like clovers and wild strawberries to thrive. And um, while clovers might not be native, and a lot of our lawn weeds might not be native, they're still providing some opportunities for pollination and nectar collection, nectar and pollen collection from some of our really important uh, pollinators. So this, I just took this picture the other day of a black swallowtail butterfly uh, feasting on red clover flowers, which have a lot of nectar in them. Um, red clover is actually a European weed, but it also um, is not necessarily something that we have to um, remove as soon as we see. It actually helps fix nitrogen in the soil and it provides, it provides um, pollinator opportunities. On the other hand, while we want to, you know, we want to let things flower a little bit more, we also want to pay attention to the other parts of our pollinators life cycles. So as an adult, the black swallowtail butterfly um, uses nectar from flowers as its food source. But as a caterpillar, which is a good portion of its life, it actually eats the leaves of carrot family plants. Um, here it is eating fennel, which is a garden plant, not a native plant. Um, but it's a really nice, um, uh, you know, example of how they actually thrive on very specific plants because they, they can thrive on, you know, some of our garden carrots and fennel and, um, and celery, but they also, you know, could be provided more opportunities if we planted some of our native carrot family plants like Sweet Sicily and, um, Golden Alexanders and Angelica. And we can provide opportunities for the larval stages of moth and butterfly caterpillars um, for more opportunities in planting maybe some native lawn alternatives. So this is a really lovely native lawn alternative. It's a sedge, which is a grass-like plant, not a true grass, um, but that doesn't matter too much. Um, it actually, like other grass-like plants, it is wind pollinated, so it's not pollinated by animals. And it doesn't provide nectar or pollen for bees and butterflies, but it provides foliage uh, for their caterpillars, which is a really important way to support um, our pollinators. Um, something that's great about Pennsylvania sedge is it doesn't really require mowing. You could mow it once a year at the most if you want to keep a clean look, but um, it has this beautiful kind of cascading hair-like quality that I really appreciate. And if you're not mowing it, then you're keeping that vegetation there for um, the caterpillars. So it's not a sterile landscape, even if it doesn't have flowers. It also doesn't require other inputs like fertilizers and extra water once established, and it thrives in the shade. Um, so it's a really awesome lawn alternative that a lot of people are getting into. Another lawn alternative or ground cover um, is that's a, an edible species is wild strawberry. And you all might be familiar with um, ornamental strawberry. The wild strawberry is a native plant that creates a really um, amazing carpet. It spreads by runners or stolons and across, like along the ground. And um, it is all larval host to, I think, 75 species of moss and butter, butterfly caterpillars. Um, it's, so that's the foliage. They eat the, that foliage, but then once it flowers, it hosts a wide range of bees, including honeybees, but a lot of our native bees as well. Um, that feast on the nectar. And then later, we can enjoy the fruits of uh, those pollinators' labor by eating the strawberries. And those strawberries are also there for birds and squirrels and other, all the other wildlife that might need them. Um, so who wouldn't want an edible ground cover? 
Another ground cover that um, can take the place of lawn in some of the drier, sunnier parts of the landscape or can knit very nicely into an existing lawn is pussy toes. And there's a wide variety of species of pussy toes. This is just one of them. This is the little leaf pussy toes, which has fairly little leaves. And it's very adapted to drought. Um, uh, drought tolerant plants sometimes exhibit qualities like having fuzzy leaves and having small minute leaves and being ground hugging as a way to conserve water. And it's actually um, really um, important for one species of butterfly in particular, the American lady. Another plant in this family, the pearly everlasting, um, and some of the other plants that are related to pussy toes and pearly everlasting um, also support the American lady. But I also want to point out here that um, while you, you know, while you're thinking about planting things for pollinators, there's a certain level of acceptance of munching that you have to, and you, you can start to enjoy, even though um, the ornamental qualities of the plant for a period of time might be a little bit lower. Um, it doesn't mean that this plant isn't gorgeous at other times of year and provide a lot of value. And I like to argue that um, when thinking about ornamental qualities of plants, we should think about the pollinators as another side of that. Um, we can do a lot of observation um, beyond just looking at the plants themselves and we can look at the interactions between the plants and the natural world um, to find beauty and inspiration. So the American lady butterfly lays its eggs in spring on the leaves of pussy toes and then as the caterpillars hatch out of those eggs, um, they kind of create a webbing and curl the leaf around themselves and then they munch, munch, munch through spring. And by late spring, um, the, the leaves are pretty defoliated and they don't look great, to be honest. But once the caterpillars pupate and form chrysalises and then become butterflies, um, the plants have another chance to regenerate some new growth. So just keep those kinds of things in mind. When, when you do see munching on leaves, it's not always a pest. Sometimes it's a beneficial insect. So we've talked about some of the ground covers that you can replace lawn with, and there's many, many more. Um, tomorrow evening, I'm actually doing a webinar for, through Native Plant Fest um, on uh, lawn alternatives, and it's called Plants Not Lawns. So um, I, I have a passion for thinking about that too, thinking about how we can replace our lawn uh, with a variety of other alternatives. But instead of just replacing it with other types of lawns, even though some of our native lawn alternatives uh, provide opportunities for pollinators, we can convert our lawns to layers. So we can create way more habitat by adding trees and shrubs, other ground covers, um, uh, low flowering perennials and taller perennials and other forbs, grasses. So um, there's a lot of, you know, going back to that 70% critical threshold of native plant biomass that we need to support pollinators and other wildlife to keep our food webs intact. Um, our, most of the biomass goes into the bigger plants, the plants that take up most, the, most of the space. And trees and shrubs are those plants. So, if you can fill your landscape with trees and shrubs and other per and perennials as well, um, then lawn becomes not the default landscape, but it becomes maybe the pathways that you walk through or the places for gathering or recreation. So we don't need to do away with lawn. Lawn is, is a, you know, helpful to us, um, but we can, you know, we can think more uh, smartly about how we um, design our landscapes. So plant trees, uh, these trees in particular are the most supportive of life. Oaks support over 400 species of moth and butterfly caterpillars. Um, and the rest of these species support almost as many. So, um, you know, start with oaks, start with cherries, birches, elms, willows, and poplars. And a lot of these can be canopy trees. Um, you can 
Um, you can, you know, do th other things to kind of convert your lawn. Um, so kind of going back a little bit to the um, lawn alternatives idea, at Nisami Farm, which is a native plant trust um, flower, or sorry, plug nursery, they have a parking lot that is full of just kind of the default lawn landscape. It's um, an unmanicured lawn. Um, it's not really doing a lot for anything, um, except that it's an easy thing to manage. They mow frequently. Um, but they do have some really beautiful trees planted in the landscape. Pin oak is a really great oak to start with because it tolerates a wide range of, um, of site conditions. It's uh, in the natural habitat, it's actually a uh, wetland species, but it's also used on highway margins and as a street tree because it's very tolerant to drought as well. So um, pin oak, it doesn't, it's not one of our bigger oaks. It's a little bit more of a, a smaller species and it has a really lovely form. Um, I like to think of it as um, the form as, you know, the branches kind of point up towards the top of the tree. And then as you go down, they start pointing down to the ground. So it has a really nice form. Um, so at Nasami Farm, they decided to replace some of their lawn um, with lawn alternatives, some of those native lawn alternatives that we talked about. And they did this through a process called lasagna mulch or sheet mulching is kind of the, the more widely known um, term. And that's basically adding organic matter like cardboard um, with a loam or soil mix and then mulch on top to smother and organ add organic matter to the soil. And then you can, you can leave that for a month or two and then plant right into it. A fall planting is kind of ideal because then things have cooled down a little bit so then you can plant. Um, they were very careful as you can see in here to not um, bring the sheet mulch too close to the root flare or the base of the tree. And that's essential when working around trees or planting trees is to make sure that you're not burying that root flare um, because as the trunk gets buried, it can get girdled and the tree will die somewhat slowly. It might die over several years, maybe a little bit longer, um, but you won't realize it until it's too late. Um, basically, it cuts off, it rots the, the, the bark around the tree if you, if you pile up too much mulch or soil around it, and then it rots it, and therefore cutting off its ability to send water and nutrients up and down the stem. So make sure to just be careful of those things when you're planting. This is the lawn alternatives bed shortly after it was planted. Um, another canopy tree. Uh, which is just one of my all-time favorite trees is black cherry. And black cherry is one of those top producers. Um, it hosts a lot of moth and butterfly caterpillars and a, hosts so other, um, a wide range of other insects. Uh, when I was at Garden in the Woods, uh, we actually raised silk moths. And that was a really fun process because we got to see the life cycle of some of these moths. Now I have to disclose that silk moths are actually not pollinators, but they're just as important to the food web as other pollinators because of their ability to feed birds. Um, and while they, while they don't perform you know, pollination, um, they, they do a lot of other things. Um, so how their life cycle works is they spend most of their time as caterpillars um, and cocoons. They um, hatch from their eggs in spring. They munch on cherry leaves and a few other host plants, but mainly cherry throughout, mo for, throughout most of the growing season. And then they pupate and become cocoons. They overwinter in those cocoons and then it close or hatch from their cocoons um, in the, next, the following spring. And then you have the adult moth, which is the Cecropia. It's a, actually the biggest a silk moth we have in the Northeast. It's the, so the size of a small bird. And it's extremely beautiful. The reason you probably haven't seen this moth is because it's nocturnal and it only lives as an adult for just a few days. So it lives just to reproduce. The females call in a male, sometimes from a couple miles away. They mate and then they lay their eggs on the host plant. And then the process starts over again. So um, 
you know, there's a, a lot of other examples I could give you for um, what loves cherries, but I'll just stop with that because I think that's a really nice one. Small trees are also a good way to go if you're not ready to plant a canopy tree. Um, some of the, my favorite small trees that are really great for pollinators are beech plum, choke cherry, go to dogwood, flowering dogwood, service berry, mussel wood, which can be kind of thought of as a small shrub or a, a shrub as well, red bud, sweet bay magnolia, and witch hazel. And true fruit trees that produce fruits both for people and birds and other wildlife um, are the beech plum and service berry. And I pick these two to talk about, especially because they're great for urban areas. Um, beach plum, its natural habitat is actually um, a coastal sand plain, very sandy habitat that often is subjected to salt spray. So it can be planted on the side of a road. Um, and service berry, which um, can grow in a wide range of habitats and tolerate a lot. So in terms of the conditions they can tolerate, they hold up to a lot. They're absolutely beautiful. Service berry is sometimes called June berry, but I think in New England, July berry is probably a better name for it because its berries actually kind of come in in July. And they taste kind of between, I'd say, a, a cherry and a plum. Um, other people say they have kind of an almond taste. Um, and then beach plums, though they're kind of close to the size of a cherry, I've seen bigger ones than the size of a cherry. They taste like a true plum and they're delightful. Um, so, you know, you can plant fruit trees that are also very supportive of pollinators. These are both in the rose family and the rose family is full of pollinator plants. This is a robin eating a service berry. I love this picture. Um, and shrubs. Uh, many of the shrubs that are listed here are also in the, the, the plant genre of some of those top six trees that I talked about earlier. So pussy willow, it's one of the will willows are very high producers and they support a wide variety of life. Um, and I'll talk about one shrub here. Um, spice bush is is really thought, I think of it as a tasty treat for all of us uh, as well. So I'm concentrating a lot on, you know, our edible species because I know that a lot of us are um, food enthusiasts. So if we can plant uh, native food plants that are also supportive of wildlife, all the better. Um, spice bush, you know, it lands on the spectrum of more of a, uh, you wouldn't eat this for calories, you would eat this for its flavor. There are other plants, native plants that are medicinal, other plants that are food plants, but this one's more of like a spice, and so it's aptly named. Um, its berries and its leaves are extremely tasty um, when incorporated into different dishes. Um, and it's one of the first bloomers of the season. So that's important because we only have so many plants that um, support the very early emerging pollin pollinators like flies and um, spice bush is one of those. Its flowers are not necessarily as huge and showy as forsythia, but I kind of think of it as a forsythia alternative because forsythia is kind of like one of the first bits of color you get in spring, but if you plant um, spice bush, you get kind of the same effect. Um, and then it's uh, very supportive of a lot of species of moth and caterpillar uh, larvae, including the spice bush swallowtail, which is extremely cute. It has these, um, this enlarged head and then these false eyes um, that you see. Those are actually uh, like just markings to scare away birds and its true eyes are a little bit below that if you can look a little bit more closely at that picture. Any questions so far before I go any further? Good, good timing, Anna. There was just a, a question in the chat about uh, which zones are best, and I think it was in reference to the spice bush. Which, uh, oh, okay, our hardiness zones, I'm guessing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so spice bush is native to New England um, and to the southeast as well. So it, um, I would probably stick in, let's see, I'm not actually sure off the top of my head if it 
is uh, present in northern Maine or northern New England, but I would safely say central and southern New England. Um, it would fit nicely into those zones. Um, but, you know, with climate change, um, I think that it's safe to say we can plant some things that um, are present a little farther south of us and um, our climate is warming and uh, a lot of plants are thriving um, farther north than they used to. So I wouldn't really worry about um, the zone for spicebush. If, if you're in New, New England, um, you should be able to plant it and have no problem. All right. So, um, well, I have one other question, if you don't oh. mind. Um, just jumped in. Any tips on distinguishing male spicebush flowers from female flowers? Yeah, that can be tricky. Um, yeah, so I didn't mention that some, some plants are what you call dioecious, and that's a botany term. But what that means is two houses. Monoecious is one house. Dioecious means that the male um, flowers are on different plants than the female flowers. And some species have this. Um, spicebush is one of them. So if you want the berries of spicebush, you need to plant the female. Um, and if you want to make sure that you have good fruit set, it's a good idea to plant the male too if you don't have any other habitat for spicebush around you. So you probably have spicebush if you have wetlands around you because it's a pretty common plant in wetlands. Um, if you have that, then I would just plant the, the female um, and not worry about it if you want to get berries. The flowers themselves, um, I think you really need a, um, a hand lens to be able to really see the different flower parts. Um, and that's a little bit advanced, but um, you want to look for stamens for the male plants and then stigmas for the female plants. Stamens will have pollen on them. Um, they'll have a slightly different structure. And you can, sometimes you can get a sense of what the pollen bearing parts are the stamens. Um, the anthers are the very end of the stamens and they, they have the pollen. So you can get a sense for um, what uh, might be the anthers and what might be the stigmas just by looking at that. Usually a stigma is shaped um, so that it kind of has a little bit of a, a wider base at the bottom and then it kind of goes up and flares out at the top a little bit that's the receptive part of the stigma and it go, then the pollen goes down into the ovary um, and down into the, the stigma and the style, which is the tube and then down into the ovary. So if you can kind of get a sense for how those parts work, then you can identify them. Um, and, you know, um, that's a real, it's a harder thing to kind of describe. So I'd have to show more people in person, um, but that's a good start. Great. So, uh we are getting, there's a couple more if you don't mind. Okay, I'll take one more question and then we'll, I'll go on um, and answer the rest at the end. How does that sound? Perfect, uh, there's two votes for this one. So let's, um, suggestion for planting trees or bush this late in the season in this area. Is that mm -hmm. a concern for timing? Okay, so um, that's a good, good point. Um, we're in August now, early August, and it's still, we're ha still having a bit of a heat wave in New England. So um, I would say, you know, you can plant a shrub or a tree anytime during the growing season. But I'd say that spring and fall are the most ideal times to plant, um, especially because watering is less of an issue if you're planting in spring and fall. Of course, anytime you're planting a new perennial tree or shrub, you want to be watering through establishment. And for trees and shrubs, that means um, up to a couple years. Uh, for perennials, that's usually the first growing season, sometimes into the second growing season if there happens to be a drought in the middle of the summer. Um, but if you, if you plant right now, you just wanna make sure you water very well. I would start doing your fall planting um, in mid to late August. Um, usually the heat wave is generally gone by then and through September. So um, those are great months to plant. And it's nice to know that, you know, uh, you, you might have had a spring push for planting, but then you get a second wave of uh, great planting time. Planting in the fall is great because it sets you up for success in the spring. So if you plant in the fall, um, you just want to make sure you don't plant too late into the fall because you do want to allow the root system to establish and that will help hold the plant in place um, and prevent prevent heaving over the winter. If you do plant a little bit later, 
just go and check the plant periodically throughout the winter and just make sure it hasn't risen up out of the ground because if it does heave and rise up out of the ground, then its roots can um, can get hit by the cold and uh, get dried out. And that's not something that you want. So you want to keep it in the ground. Um, and then in spring, if you plant in the fall and spring, you just, those plants are just ready to go in spring. They will immediately start putting off new growth. They've already been in the ground for a little bit, so they're not in that transplant shock stage. Um, so yeah, fall is a great time to plant. All right, I'll answer the rest of the questions at the end, since we're about halfway through. Um, so I talked a little bit about trees and shrubs and other ways to fill vertical space um, are with vines. And just a few vines here, Virginia creeper, is one of the only host plants for the Pandora sphinx moth. Um, that um, caterpillar is extremely beautiful. And this is actually the same caterpillar, but in two different instar stages. Um, so caterpillars actually go through several instar stages, which means that they, you know, they kind of molt between these different stages and emerge um, without their skin, emerge like sometimes a different color, usually a little bit bigger. And so that's, you know, you might know what a caterpillar looks like uh, of a certain species at one point in its, um, in its time as a caterpillar, but then it might look very different later on. Um, so something to keep in mind when you're doing ID. And Virginia creeper, it gets kind of a reputation as weedy. It does have a look a little bit like poison ivy, so you have to make sure you identify it correctly. But you can purchase it places like Native Plant Trust um, and other native plant nurseries so that you make sure you identify it correctly. Um, and I really love its fall foliage. If you give it enough sunlight, it has really brilliant fall foliage, even better than this picture shows. It can turn very um, deep crimson scarlet. It's absolutely gorgeous. Another vine is coral honeysuckle. And this one is more of a, a well-known garden plant. Um, it actually has these long tubular flowers that are particularly attractive to hummingbirds. And tubular flowers in general are because if you, it just makes sense, their beak or bill can fit pretty nicely and tidily into those long tubes to reach. Usually the flowers that are attractive to hummingbirds have a high nectar content. Um, so those would be cardinal flower and scarlet bee balm. And even some of our shrubs like um, early azalea, which is one of our native woodland shrubs. Um, they're often very fragrant plants. Uh, cardinal flower isn't, but um, rhododendron prinophyllum or early, azalea, or early azalea is. And something to just keep in mind is that hummingbirds, they're pollinators, yes, but they're not always the most effective pollinators. They're known as re nectar robbers. So sometimes they just pierce right through the tube of the plant to get straight to the nectar. I mean, sorry, the tube of the flower to get straight to that nectar, bypassing the reproductive parts. So that would be, they bypass the anthers, which contain the pollen and the stigmas, which are the female portions of the flower and go right into the nectar uh, bearing portion. Um, that means that the pollen doesn't necessarily drop onto them and then they're not necessarily transporting it to neighboring flowers. Um, so, you know, I love hummingbirds and I, I think we should support them as well. Um, their habitat is just as important as what they forage on throughout the year. So they um, need trees to nest in. They need to nest in high canopy trees to avoid predators. Um, Thinking about going back to lawn and how we can reduce our lawn footprint. Uh, we, can we can convert our lawn to layers. We can convert our lawn into a garden full of many layers, or we can convert it to meadow. Now, I really like thinking about it as why mow when you can meadow. And meadows are actually the kinds of places that we most frequently associate pollinator gardens with. Um, there are so many great pollinator plants in meadows, um, not just because of their flowers, but also because of their ability to host insects at other stages of their life cycles too, just like trees and shrubs and vines. Um, one of my favorite um, plants actually recently, I have what I, some of uh, the staff from Garden in the Woods, we 
we talk about plants that are our favorites as plant crushes because they come in, they, you know, they last for a period of time, but we have many of them. So I don't have one favorite of anything. I have a lot of plants that I get really into for periods of time as a plant nerd. And this is one that I had a lot of um, fun with uh, when I was helping establish the meadow at Garden in the Woods. We redid the meadow and we established it with this native cover crop. Um, it's called partridge pea. It turned out to be an incredible pollinator powerhouse as well. Um, you can see it germinated very well. We sowed seed in spring and, um, and it basically is what we use to kind of hold the ground, fix nitrogen like a lot of our cover crops do in the, in the pea family especially and kind of keep the weed seeds out while the slower growing um, seeds of grasses and other longer lived perennials um, could get established or could germinate and then get established. So over, over about three years, partridge pea started off very dominant in the meadow. And then as our other plants in the meadow got established, the partridge pea kind of dwindled out because since it's an annual, one of its reproductive strategies is to throw off huge quantities of seed and um, find places to germinate where there's exposed soil. And if there's less and less exposed soil with newly establishing plants, then it can't kind of keep going. And so the population dwindles out over time, which was part of, which was the goal. Uh, we wanted to have this be a, a cover crop, so a shorter lived um, crop. And it's really amazing as a cover crop, but also um, it has a lot of pollinator value. So those beautiful big showy flowers are um, attractive to pollinators, but they actually only contain pollen and no nectar. They do have pollen bearing, I mean, nectar bearing parts though, um, in these little nectary glands called extra floral nectaries at the base of the leaf stem or the petiole. So a whole leaf is basically, you can see, let's see, I'll, I'll circle one with my mouse. This is a whole leaf and all these tiny little things coming off of it are leaflets. They're like sub leaves. And then the petiole is right here. It connects the leaf to the stem, to the main stem. So these extra floral nectaries are cup shaped and contain nectar. And pollinators go after these like crazy. Beetles, butterflies, bees, wasps, flies, ants, um, all sorts of insects. And um, then the ants are actually, they have a special relationship with this plant where they forage on this nectar, um, which actually plays no part in reproduction because it's not anywhere close to the flowers. And then in turn, they protect the plant from predation from other herbivores. So they keep other things from eating it um, because ants actually put out a lot of um, uh, chemicals or secretions um, that might make, you know, might be poisonous or might make, you know, the mouth of another insect feel itchy or something like that. So um, they do this with a couple different, uh, with a lot of different species of plants um, and they play a part um, as well. So um, Partridge pea, I also, I've read an article on partridge pea as a potential trap crop for um, harmful insects or pests um, to some of our, um, to some of our, you know, edible food crops. So there was a study actually that um, they planted partridge pea right next to a corn, a, you know, a corn crop. And they found that there were um, actually beneficial insects which predate um, some of the pests like corn European corn borers and other pests that eat corn um, found on partridge pea. And also the partridge pea was luring all those different insects to the partridge pea itself instead of going onto the corn. So um, this native cover crop has a lot of application for agricultural use too. And I argue that a lot of our, our other native plants do as well. We just have yet to find, do even more research to find out all the different ways that they can. Another pea family plant that is um, an, a really important pollinator plant, not just in its flowers, um, 
is the sundial lupin, our native lupin. A lot of New England, it, the, if you drive along the roadsides in midsummer, um, a lot of New England is actually full of western lupin, which is considered invasive in a few different states of New England. And it's actually been intentionally planted out um, onto roadsides because it's very beautiful. It um, you know, comes in a range of colors. It gets really big and robust. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't support the a Carner blue butterfly like our sundial lupin does. And our sundial lupin um, is actually the reason, you know, it's actually the reason that this pollinator is at risk is because the sundial lupin is at risk. It's a rare species in New England. Um, it thrives in really sandy soils. And so you might find it on the coast or in inland sand plains. Um, but if you think about it, development happens where the perk tests are good, where sandy soils are good. So a lot of the habitats for plants who th that thrive in sandy soils are diminished by development. And in turn, the plants um, and the, the pollinators that those plants support are at risk as well. So the Carner blue butterfly is actually solely dependent on lupin, the sundial lupin, um, as its main food source for its larval, um, in its larval stage, its caterpillar stage. We also have heard a lot about milkweeds uh, recently. They're kind of like the poster child for pollinator plants, especially native pollinator plants. And they're really important. Most, you know, most of our butterflies and moths don't migrate the way that um, the way that um, the monarch caterpillar does. So it, I mean, sorry, the monarch butterfly does. So it migrates all the way down to Mexico, its breeding grounds. But it comes up to North America um, and um, goes far north into the northern United States. Mainly the Midwest is where the monarch butterfly um, it really has its huge habitat source. Unfortunately, um, because of Roundup ready crops and the spraying of Roundup um, and the conversion of prairie to corn and soy and wheat, um, we have a lot less milkweed for monarch butterfly caterpillars to rely on in the Midwest. So there has been a huge effort to plant all of the different species of milkweeds in other parts of the country too, to help support monarch caterpillars. Um, and their populations have been kind of coming back up, but they're still nowhere near where they used to be and where they need to be. So um, monarch butterfly caterpillars actually, you know, will eat the foliage of uh, most um, milkweed species. And one of my favorite species is the butterfly milkweed. <laughs> aptly named because um, the butterfly milkweed, the flowers themselves um, are butterfly and bee magnets and wasp magnets as well. Um, but, you know, this is a species that thrives in really dry sandy soils, very much like um, the sundial lupin. And it's growing right next to Monarda punctata, the spotted bee balm, um, which is this really funky looking plant. I love it. It's kind of a Dr. Seuss like plant. Um, and they both host, uh, like I mentioned, a wide range of bees and wasps and butterflies. And I particularly see the great black wasp a lot on the spotted bee balm. It's this kind of blue iridescent wasp. And, you know, while you can plant the flowers um, for it to have a nectar source, it also needs um, kind of a sandy soil habitat for um, its nesting places. So it nests in, it creates these holes, it digs itself and creates these cavities in sandy places to nest in. So keeping sandy soil and planting um, in kind of some of these really dry, well-drained areas and using sand as a top dressing is a really good way to support um, some of these ground nesting bees and wasps. A lot of our native bees and wasps in general are actually solitary animals. They don't colonize the way that honeybees do. Um, there are some exceptions, like some, some bumblebees that do colonize. Um, but most of them do nest in cavities. So some are ground nesting. Some nest in the cavities of old wood, like woodpecker holes and trees. 
Um, some nest in plant stems. And these plants um, right here are particularly great for nesting places for um, some of our native bees and wasps. So flowering raspberry, which also hosts a lot of bees on its flowers, common elder, an edible species and medicinal plant as well, and Joe pie weed. And if you cut these stems, kind of slice them, a section of them, you would look at kind of what looks like in the right hand picture. They have hollow or pithy stems that act as chambers for the bees to lay their eggs um, into. And so what they do is the bees lay maybe about 20 to 30 rows of eggs um, capped with wax in those chambers. And then the, the new young bees hatch in spring. What you can do to support them is to plant some of these plants that have those hollow or pithy stems. And then instead of cutting all your plants back to the ground in the fall, generally I like to, you know, wait and do that in spring, early spring, so that you can keep the seed heads and stems up through the winter to support birds and other uh, wildlife through the winter. But you can cut these back maybe about 18 inches um, high just to give enough space for the bees to lay their eggs. Um, if you do want to cut things back and keep things a little bit more tidy. You can also install bee hotels and things like that into your landscape. Um, and those would look like, you know, sometimes those are filled with um, bamboo because they're hollow. Um, sometimes it's a solid piece of wood with drilled holes into it of different sizes for different types of bees. Um, no matter what you do, if you're creating a bee hotel, just make sure that you're changing the material out every year because they can breed um, different pathogens if left there year after year. And a lot of people get really excited about installing bee hotels into their landscapes. But um, just make sure to clean them out just so that the bees can continue to thrive there each year. Checking time. Um, we're getting a little bit later on time, so I'm going to go through certain slides a little faster than others. Um, but definitely at the end, if you have any questions about um, anything in particular that I didn't cover, um, I would definitely welcome that. Um, so late season forage is really essential to a lot of our bees and other pollinators. Um, and asters, goldenrods, and um, snake root, a, a couple of these different genre of plants provide that. Asters and goldenrods are really incredible pollinator plants. They're up there with those top six tree genre that I was talking about earlier because they're not only great late season forage, but they're also um, really great hosts for the larvae of moth and butterflies. They're caterpillars. Um, flax leaf stiff aster is uh, really an awesome kind of garden friendly aster that's really tidy looking. It grows kind of like more erect and as doesn't get more than about six to eight inches tall. Um, and it has these this really nice fine feathery textured foliage. Um, creates a really well nice ground cover and this is also mainly suited to kind of those gravelly or sandy soils that are well drained and full sun. I also love its fall color. Um, and then for other late season forage, other asters that are great for shade or into the sun, these uh, take a wide range of conditions. The blue wood aster, very, very floriferous, and the white wood aster. And I wanna point out just, you know, that, that in the picture at the bottom right, this is the Rose Kennedy Greenway. This is an urban landscape. And a lot of people think, you know, native plants need to just go into the the wilder parts of our landscapes, the edge of the forest, the meadows, the rural areas, um, the places where we have a lot of space and where we don't mind things looking messy. But look at how beautiful and billowy and ornamental the whitewood aster looks behind the bench in this photo. Um, I argue that native plants are just as ornamental and valuable in some of our urban and suburban landscapes as our, as our non-native species. Goldenrods, like I mentioned earlier, they're up there with asters um, in supporting moth and butterfly caterpillars and tons and tons of bees, flies, wasps, beetles. Um, this just the other day, I was at Rock Hill 
um, sorry, Beach Hill Preserve in Rockport, Maine, and took this picture. Um, goldenrod is already starting to bloom. And this is the Canada goldenrod. This is one of the more, um, what you might call weedy species of goldenrod because it spreads um, very rapidly. And um, this is not one that I would plant in a small garden. I would save this one for the highway margins, the edges of the, of the forest, the meadows that you have, those bigger open spaces because it takes up space. It's not a bad thing though. And goldenrods get a uh, reputation for being not only a little weedy, but uh, causing allergies, which is false. Um, goldenrods actually don't cause fall allergies. The causes of fall allergies are those wind pollinated uh, plants like grasses and ragweeds. The, they're important to say they're wind pollinated because their pollen is airborne and it, go, it actually transports itself just by the wind. It blows the pollen from flower to flower, um, fertilizing the female portion of the flowers. Um, so goldenrods are animal pollinated. And so that means they require an animal to rub against the flower and pick up some of that pollen and transport it to the next flower. And so it can't cause allergies that way. Some garden worthy goldenrods that I love. Um, some of these might be a little bit obscure for some of you, but I like highlighting the garden worthy goldenrods. Um, goldenrods are one of my favorite plant genres. Um, the gray goldenrod, it's a nice short goldenrod. It doesn't get more than a foot and a half and it's not as aggressive because other plants overtop it and keep it in check. Um, the silver rod is a lesser known goldenrod. It's the only one that has creamy white flowers and not yellow flowers. And then the shade loving goldenrods are reef goldenrod for more drier areas. Dry slopes are great. And then zigzag goldenrod for kind of the moist shade. Um, I really, I couldn't go without talking about the mint family here. Um, these are some of our native mints are bee magnets and you might already understand that mints are bee magnets and the mint family in general because we have because we have you know spearmints and winter green or sorry winter mint lemon mint um, all these different species of mints um, that are usually European mints and they're not native to New England so there's nothing wrong with them they're great they make great teas they do support pollinators but I just want you to know about some of these native mints that um, support a lot of bees. And the broad-leaved mountain mint especially, Pycnanthema muticum, has a, it's very showy uh, with its kind of, the, the flowers are surrounded by these leaves that are actually bracts um, that they look like the flowers, but the flowers are in the center and they kind of turn like kind of a whitish and they last a really long time. They have a fragrance that is, um, unmistakably minty, but it has some other layer to it that I can't really describe. You have to just try it. It's, it's the best smelling mint I know. And if I just grab a leaf and put it under my nose, I could like leave it there all day. I just love it so much. You can't get enough of it. The slender leaf mountain mint also has some fragrance, but it's not quite as fragrant as the broad leaf mountain mint. But it's great for those um, dry sunny areas and it has a really nice feathery texture. And back to the shade, um, there are shady um, perennials, shade loving perennials that um, are very much pollinator plants and, you know, magnetize pollinators for their flowers. So it's not just those plants that are growing in open full sun, those kind of meadow like plantings that you might associate with pollinator plantings. Black cohosh is one of them. It's known as a medicinal plant, a long history of use. And um, it's flowers taking a little bit look, closer look. Oh, let me show you from afar too. The black cohosh in this picture are these kind of candelabra-like whimsical tall tower of tower flowers, <laughs> the tall racemes. Um, they blend really nicely into the woodland landscape. And they don't smell that great when you get up close to them. There are other species of acteas that are native a little farther south that actually do have some nice fragrance, but their fragrance attracts um, a lot of flies and beetles and wasps and bees. 
um, and uh, other pollinators too. Um, and so basically when, when they're flowering, if you go up to the flower, every, it's just kind of moving with insect life. And they create a kind of a whole food web amongst themselves with all the different pollinators that are attracted to them. They um, also attract other things like spiders, so predators of some of those smaller insects. And they're a larval host as well. So the Appalachian is their butterfly. Um, it's only um, larval host plant is the black cohosh. And it's uh, caterpillars feed on the buds of the flowers. And then as the flowers bloom, they go down to the leaves. While it's feeding on the buds, ants actually um, eat the honeydew secretions coming from those caterpillars, or they're basically eating their poop. <laughs> and in turn, they're um, so, you know, helping protect the plant from predation, just like partridge pea. I'm getting close to the home stretch, if you can bear with me, and then um, I'll have some time for questions uh, before 6.30 come, rolls around. Um, so another way that you can think about supporting pollinators is, yes, you want to plant all the plants that support them. But you also want to you know, consider their life cycles and what that means for the types of management strategies you have in your landscape. So another example of a plant that has that's a host to a butterfly larvae is um, the Kiloni glabra, the white turtle head. Um, the Baltimore checker spot only hosts or only goes onto a few plants in its larval stage, and white turtle head is one of them. So its life cycle takes a couple of years to complete, actually. So this has implications for how you would manage your landscape. First, it lays its eggs on the um, axles of the, between the, the main branches and the main stem. And then um, it lays its eggs in a large quantity and they're gregarious caterpillars that stick together for most of their lives. Um, they create a web around themselves that protects them from predators. And they use this webbing to kind of bridge themselves from, they'll start eating one branch of leaves and they'll bridge themselves onto the next neighboring branch through that web and they'll all crawl over together and eat more. It's a really fascinating thing to watch. They eat um, the chelone or coloni for a good portion of that season and then they crawl down to the leaf litter and overwinter there um, until next spring. Next spring they eat even more. They crawl back up to the plant together and they eat as much as they can gaining energy and then they pupate about midsummer or early summer and to these gorgeous chrysalises and then become butterflies, their adult stage. So what does that mean for management practices? Leave the leaves. Um, this is important for overwintering insects like a lot of moth and butterfly species. So a lot of moth species, actually the cocoons, um, uh, actually overwinter in the leaf litter. They went overwinter in the ground, on the ground, not just hanging from branches. Um, and then the caterpillars of a lot of different species of moths and butterflies overwinter under leaves. Um, salamanders overwinter under leaves and a wide range of other insects and animals do. So when you remove the leaves, um, you're removing that habitat for them and sometimes interrupting their life cycles. Leaves are also really important for the health of the soil. They enrich the soil with organic matter and nutrients and they keep the soil protected and moist. Um, and they're just so important for so many things. Um, so if you can leave the leaves and this might mean that you, you know, move the leaves out of the small lawn space that you've shrunk down to a, just the essential areas that you need lawn, but you're, you're keeping those leaves as your mulch. Most of the time people uh, remove the leaves in the fall and then uh, bag their leaves and send them away and they might get composted or thrown out somewhere. And then they replace all that valuable organic matter and habitat with bark mulch later in um, the next spring. So you could be saving money and saving habitat by leaving the leaves. Lastly, I wanna just touch quickly upon 
when you buy plants, um, you want to source quality plants. And that is, it can be very tricky to do um, when sourcing native plants. So some rules of thumb, if you can, this is probably the hardest one, but I, I really think you should try, is to avoid plants that are grown with systemic pesticides. Um, we've probably been hearing more and more about pesticides in general and how detrimental they are to pollinators. Well, these certain systemic pesticides called neonicotinoids um, are used in most nurseries and they're injected into the plant. Um, they go into the entire vascular system of the plant and they can remain there for several years. That means that all the insects and animals that are eating the foliage of those plants for those couple years while the pesticides are still present are ingesting them. And that's working their way, they're working their way through the food chain. So, and all those different trophic levels. So you, you really wanna think about that. So what I would suggest is if you don't know if your local nursery or grower um, uses systemic pesticides, call them up and ask them if they grow plants without them, ask them to not grow plants with them. Um, they might say no, they might not give you a clear answer, but I think the more consumers are demanding what they want, just like with organic food, um, the, the industry will turn to what the consumers want. So be an advocate for growing plants without pesticides. Also grow plants from seed if possible. Seed, uh, Wild Seed Project actually grow, um, sells seed of native plants. And we do this because seeds are prolific. Um, plants produce tons of seeds. It's a really great way to get a lot of plants out into the landscape. So if we give people seeds, they can grow many more plants than if they buy you know, a one gallon potted plant. But um, seeds are also full of genetic diversity. So each seed grown plant will be different from the last. That means that it might have qualities that are adapted to you know, different aspects of climate change that could be coming down the road. It might be, have qualities that um, are more adaptable to drought or flooding or and a pest in, um, outbreak, anything like that. So um, you know, that's different from most nursery plants, which are cloned. They're cloned through tissue culture or they're grown through cuttings. So each plant is identical to the last. If you buy a native plant at Home Depot, it's gonna be very different than if you buy a plant from maybe Wild Seed Project or um, Native Plant Trust. So just keep that in mind. Um, and if you can grow your own plants from seed, it's a really empowering thing to do. And a lot of you I'm sure are very used to growing veggies and herbs from plants. Native seeds are actually easier to grow, a lot less labor intensive in the spring. A lot of them can be sown in the fall and they actually require a cold moist stratification through the winter. So they're sown outdoors into a pot in the fall and then you get new seedlings sometimes that year. Um, and then it's, it's a lot easier than coddling some of our tender vegetables um, in spring indoors. Um, so I, I would say give it a try. Here's a good list to start you off of where you can find some of these plants. Uh, these, none of these nurseries use systemic pesticides. I've done the research for you. And some further reading. So um, any more questions? All right, thanks, Anna. Um, maybe you could go back to that, um, the slide with the, the seed sources. People might wanna Take a Definitely. little bit more look at that while we're answering some questions. Thanks. Um, let's see, there was one um, micro clover that can be interplanted with lawns. I think you talked about a purple clover, but um, anything else? Yeah. yeah, a lot of people are turning to micro clover as a lawn alternative, and I think it's great. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, white clover is another option. Uh, micro clover is even smaller and kind of more of a mat forming plant. And um, that does a lot of what um, red clover does. It fixes nitrogen and it stays green um, a good portion of the season. So um, it's a really good option. It's not a native species, but that's not always essential when you're thinking about lawn alternatives because as we, we are trialing a lot of different lawn alternatives that are native grasses and sedges and other plants, um, 
and there's a lot of good ground cover alternatives, but to mimic a real turf alternative um, with a native plant is still, the research is still coming along. So um, it's okay to plant, you know, non-native lawn alternatives. There's a lot of um, fescues as well that are not necessarily native, that there's fescue mixes. Um, there's something called eco lawn that's sold from Vermont. And that's a mix of different fescues that thrive in a variety of conditions. And they do a lot of what other lawn alternatives do. They don't require input. Um, they are adaptable to a wide range of conditions and they don't require as much watering and mowing because they might be slower growing and they're just not nutrient and water hogs like regular lawns are. So um, it's really good to look for those other options when you are thinking about what is going to be your turf. And could you advance to your next slide so people have that one as well for, for sure. perfect. And then just as a note, uh, one after this, I'm going to pull back up our, our QR code for people to, to scan in case they missed that at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I had two questions, Anna. Yes. Uh, one was you talked about uh, not mulching too close to trees because of root flare. Can you describe more about that? Like defining the root flare and the second question was uh, just describe a little bit more about sheet mulching. Okay. Um, yeah, so what I mean by the root flare is um, sometimes with a smaller new tree from the nursery, it's a little harder to see the root flare. But if you look into the landscape and, and look for a mature tree, like a mature oak um, in a park or something like that, look, notice that the, the tree go, doesn't just go straight down and meet the ground it actually flares out uh, quite a bit before it meets the ground. Um, that's really critical because you don't want to cover that. up. You want that to be exposed. And the tendency when planting or when mulching trees is to plant them too deep and to mulch them too much. So there's something, um, there's a great Facebook group called Crimes Against Horticulture. And um, they have all these different um, malpractices um, in landscaping that are highlighted. And one of them is called volcano mulching. So that's one that just gets my goat. I hate volcano mulching. Basically, it's when, you know, landscapers, there are a lot of, most landscapers don't really know what they're doing, unfortunately. Um, they, you know, pile up the mulch around the base of a tree because they think that, you know, that's going to keep the weeds out. It's going to keep the water in. Yeah, mulch is great and it has its purpose but don't pile it up against the base of the tree. So when you're planting a tree, it's a little harder to tell, but basically I go by where the roots start to form. I plant just at that level. Um, and you can see on a small tree, it's very um, subtle when it's smaller, but as the tree gets older, you can see it flare out a little bit more as it gets older and older. Um, so I hope that's a little bit um, of a good answer for you and not, not too well, so, confusing. Well, so so to control growth you don't want near the base of the tree, then to use a cover plant of some sort. Yeah, That's definitely. Yeah, you can use mulch, especially in the in the early stages. But what I'd like to do is actually, as soon as I plant a tree, I like to plant a ground cover um, with it, and then it takes away the need for mulch. Right. Um, in parks and things like that, you see trees uh, with grass around them or with a mulch ring around them. Like if you've been to the Arnold Arboretum, they have these mulch rings kind of like from the drip line, which is where their branches go out to, um, down uh, at the, at, from the base of the trunk to their drip line is pretty much a mulch ring. And that, the purpose of that is yes, to keep the weeds out, but it's because those landscapes are managed by grounds crews that mow and string trim. And if you mow too close to the roots, then it will damage the roots and damage the tree. So that's just to keep the mowers from getting too close to the tree, damaging the roots. So you can, you know, plant a ground cover right up to the base of the tree. And then you wanted to know a little bit more about um, sheet mulching, right? Yeah, describe a little bit more detail about sheet mulching. Yeah, so there's a variety of ways that you can kind of prepare um, an area to be planted. And especially if you're going over turf, um, if you, instead of, you know, digging up the sod and replacing it, preparing all that soil, 
you can actually smother um, the turf out instead. So what I do is um, I, you can kind of start your sheet mulching any time of the season, but um, for a fall planting, I would probably do my sheet mulching like midsummer so that it has a little bit of time. So I would um, put down a good layer of cardboard and I, I like to get cardboard from like local grocery stores, um, other businesses that have uh, bulk cardboard around. And I just make sure to strip off all the plastic, anything that's not cardboard. I, I use the, um, the cardboard that doesn't have the shiny piece on it too, because you want it to be able to break down in the landscape. Um, and so you just layer um, a good thick layer of cardboard. It can be a couple layers, but you just need one layer. Um, and then you've whatever soil you want to bring in, you could do soil or you could do mulch. Um, so you could bring in kind of a, a loam sand mix um, for soil on top of that, a couple inches. And then on top of that, you can, you can do your plant, your plants right into it and then um, put mulch over that. And I like to use leaves as mulch. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, you want to leave the leaves as possible. Well, um, a lot of, if you don't have a lot of trees on your site at the moment, you can actually get shredded leaf um, mold or aged leaf mold from a lot of different landscapers now and use that as your mulch. Um, so does that describe it a little bit better for you? Yeah, no, that, that helps. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Great. There's um, another couple questions about um, some interest in, in you know, shade and mostly uh, shade bushes. Um, there's been a couple questions about shade and you did talk about a few shade plants, but um, specifically shade bushes. Yeah. Oh, there's so many um, shrubs for, sh for shade. But I know that shade can be the niche that's really hard to fill, especially dry shade. Um, so um, actually, summer sweet clethra or sweet pepper bush is another common name for it. Clethra almifolia is a really great one. Um, it will grow in full sun and it's naturally found in wetlands, but I've also seen it in upland areas where it's a little drier in the shade. And it gets a little bit more kind of, um, it gets a little bit longer, like not leggy, I wouldn't say, but um, the branches are reaching a little bit more in the shade. So it's not going to grow quite as densely, but it'll still be very beautiful. Mountain laurels and rhododendrons are great for shade azaleas. Um, some of our native azaleas, like swamp azalea and um, the azalea that I mentioned, um, rhododendron paracliminoides or, and prinifolium, those are both um, early azalea and pinkster bloom. Those are really great for shade. Um, and spicebush is a shade loving shrub, um, as well as witch hazel, which is also a medicinal plant. So I could go on and on, but what you can do if you want to learn more about that is Wild Seed Project has plant lists and lots of resources on their website, and you can just explore through those a little bit. Great. Uh, one specific question here about someone wanting to transplant um, Asclepsias tuberosa. Yeah. That they have that uh, growing and they'd like to transplant it. Any comments on the... Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's not as easy to transplant as some other plants because it has a taproot. So that's the butterfly milkweed that I talked about earlier. It has those beautiful orange flowers, Asclepias tuberosa. Um, it has, a, yeah, it has a taproot. So you just want to make sure to not damage that taproot. So if you use a shovel, um, my transplanting strategy is to um, use kind of what I like to use as a spade shovel when I'm transplanting, especially deeper rooted things. So a spade shovel has a flat piece on the bottom and so it makes really good cuts. It's not one of the shovels that's pointed. Um, it's a shorter shovel and it has a little handle. So um, it's specifically for transplanting called a spade shovel. Um, and I cut, I make a cut just straight into the ground all around the plant. And I don't use any leverage to try to get it out of the ground until I've made the cut all the way around and gotten the shovel deep into the soil. Then you can, once you've made your cut all the way around the plant, you can lever use leverage and try to pop it out. And you should be fine. Just that's a good way to kind of keep the root system intact and not damage it. 
Um, and that's, that's a good one to transplant that way. Um, if you try to use, you know, a weeding knife, hori hori, um, you might end up damaging the root a little bit and try not, try not to pop any bits of the root if possible. Just try to keep the root intact. Great. A um, couple questions about the leaf mulching. Um, any comments on whether it's good to shred or chop leaves you know, in the fall before mulching or you know, any comments about whole leaf or shredded leaf? Yeah, very good question. Um, if possible, just leave your leaves where they are. Um, however, I understand that leaves move around with the wind, they get piled up in different places, and also uh, sometimes there's not enough garden space for the amount of leaves that we might have in our landscape. So if our landscapes are mainly lawn, then we're going to have an excess of leaves. Just notice that relationship, the excess of leaves versus the amount of lawn that we have. So, you know, I like to rake the leaves up off the lawn that is there and shred those ones. And sometimes I'll stockpile them instead of shredding them um, in like a, a compost pile of sorts and they'll age and kind of break down over time so you don't have to physically shred them. Um, some people have mulching mowers where their mower, they just drive over it and the mower actually bags up, it shreds and bags up the leaves. Those are relatively expensive. They're on the expensive range of things. There's also um, lots of different types of leaf shredders. Um, I have one that I use that's just a little electric leaf shredder and it, it plugs in to, um, to the socket and it has a little bag attached and I just suck the leaves up and I shred them that way. So that's what I do with that, the excess leaves or if leaves have blown into like one corner, one area, and um, more than a couple inches thick, um, that's when I would remove them and shred them and then redistribute them into the garden beds. If you have too many leaves for your garden beds in general, you can keep them in a pile, like a compost pile, and let them break down. They'll break down and really consolidate themselves that way. So it's a good way to get consolidate your leaves um, to pile them up. Great, thank you. Um, I think that was most of the questions. I'm gonna. I'm going to share that QR code again in case people are looking looking for that. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, continue to type your questions or ask them for Anna. We just have a couple more minutes left here, but um, thank you so much for the the great information, Anna. I think you've gotten lots of positive comments for your your approach and just your holistic um, information. And you know, we could I think this group could talk about native plants probably for hours and hours. Um, yeah, <laughs> but we we certainly appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I realized I did not share a PDF of this presentation, but I can take a couple of minutes now if, um, and create a PDF and put it on in the chat box if people would like that. And then they can just download it and have all the resources right there. If you're able to do that, that would be great. And again, this, this presentation is recorded and everyone attending will have access to it after the fact as well. Oh, right. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. All right, well, I can do that. If there are no further questions, I can work on doing that. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any last questions that might come in. All right, and here's that QR code in case anyone else was, was looking for it. I, I have a question, Anna. Yeah. If uh, any of these ground covers, especially the really low ones that you were talking about, have you experimented or know of anyone experimented uh, using them in vegetable gardens uh, as the just as a permanent mulch uh, that's the big quest for people who are wanting healthy soil and not and to use no-till is to have a, a good ground cover that we can plant our vegetables through wow i hadn't thought about that that's a really good idea i would say that there might be some vegetables that would do well that way um, other perennial crops might work really well in that situation. So if you have, I think it would be a little tricky to plant um, annual vegetables into a denser ground cover, um, just because uh, there might not be enough space, uh, you know, place to plant them into. But something that I really like, there's kind of a permacultural, um, um, you know, um, a permacultural approach is to plant um, in 
in guilds and there is a really nice guild there's you everybody knows the corn beans and squash um, so you have the corn as the the taller plant and um, you have the beans that trellis up the corn and the squash creates the ground cover um, i think a really nice native plant um, option or kind of brother three brothers rather than three sisters might be um, jerusalem artichoke um, wild strawberry and american groundnut but i would put those into a container and not into the ground if you're not wanting those all to spread because they're all um, i wouldn't say aggressive but they're all plants that definitely proliferate themselves in the landscape so i like the idea of a, a container of those three brothers um, so again jerusalem artichoke wild strawberry and american groundnut american groundnut has edible tubers uh, a lot like potatoes um, Jerusalem artichoke also has edible tubers and wild strawberry is a ground cover and obviously has um, edible fruits. I'm, I'm going to think about that though because I, I definitely think that's a really nice idea and I'm going to think about what other native plant um, ground covers could be used for vegetable crops. Okay, let us know. <laughs> I will. Where would you get seed for the partridge pea? Ah, yes. Uh, well, Wild Seed Project um, does sell partridge pea seed, and I know it's still in stock because I was just talking the other day. Uh, another source for uh, partridge pea seed is um, Prairie Moon Nursery, and that's where I got the seed for the Garden in the Woods Meadow. Um, and what I like about Prairie Moon Nursery seed is that they give you the inoculum with it. So some plants require um, something like a the mycorrhizal associated um, with the plant in order for the seeds to germinate very well. And though partridge pea doesn't require that to germinate, it'll germinate, germinate a lot better. You'll get a higher percentage of germination if you use that inoculum. So they also give you directions on how to stratif stratify the seed. So uh, with partridge pea, I needed to um, put it in a cold, moist area. So I, I mixed it with sand um, and put a little bit of water into it and then mixed in the inoculum. And I put that in the fridge for 10 days before sowing the seed. And th that I just followed the directions that they gave me. Um, so yeah, those are two great places to get it. Thank you. Was that Prairie Moon? Yeah, Prairie Moon Nursery. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, with that, it is 6.30. Um, so I just want to uh, thank you again, Anna, for, for taking the time and sharing your wealth of information. Um, certainly a popular topic here this, uh, this afternoon. So thanks for the inspiration. And uh, good to know we can apply this still uh, this summer and fall uh, and not only next year. So um, thank you so much. And I'll just again encourage everyone else to um, uh, follow up with any questions or comments that they didn't get answered here.